Hi. So, uh, for our last keynote for this year's Munich Hack, uh, please welcome Ben Gamari. <laughs> ben uh, uh, works at WellTyped uh, and at the same time finishes his, his PhD in physics, right? Um, he <laughs> uses Haskell so for machine learning, for scientific data analysis, for robotics control, and compiler engineering. And he's uh, also a frequent GHC contributor, uh, where he focuses on code generation, on core optimization, and uh, on the runtime system of GHC. Um, also, I think he's the GHC release manager, so uh, every time a new version of GHC appears, uh, it's basically uh, Ben's, uh, Ben's doing. <laughs> um, yeah, and today he's going to talk about uh, a low latency garbage collector for GHC. So, Ben, thank you. That's right. All right, uh, can everybody hear me first? Uh, we're okay? Excellent. All right, so uh, first, just before we begin, um, you know, I understand uh, not entirely, so who here is familiar with how GHC's garbage collector currently works in any amount of detail? Okay, so that's not bad, but I'm glad that we have some background, uh, so don't worry if you did not raise your hand. There will be plenty of background, I believe, uh, and uh, of course, you know, if there are any questions as we go our, uh, on our way, then please do ask, no need to wait till the end. I think uh, everybody's better off if we're all on the same page. So uh, today, as mentioned, uh, we're going to be talking about a bit of work that uh, Omer and I have been working on for about the past year. Um, so this is uh, a client project um, that was enabled by uh, one of the larger uh, banks in the, the London area. Uh, so they... Um, are going to be bringing us a low latency garbage collector. And so why do we need a low latency garbage collector? So, you know, I as in any typical day in Haskell, right, we can write these lovely programs and they, they have all sorts of, uh, you know, we have a number of language extensions that allow you to write safe code and it gives you reasonably good performance. Uh, you can sometimes even, uh, you know, uh, you can prove quite a lot at the type system, in the type system. Um, but then you go to run your program and, know, it, it runs, and of course you get the right answer because you, know, you used you know, all those great language extensions. But then you look a little bit deeper. So here we pass this RTS-S flag, which hopefully you all know about. This is, uh, I'd highly recommend anybody who uses Haskell in production to run their programs every once in a while with this flag. This causes the runtime system to print a whole lot of useful information about the various uh, statistics, uh, how your program essentially behaved uh, during its run. And so, here we see uh, you know, some allocation amounts, and great, great. We see these numbers down here. These two lines are describing what the garbage collector did in the course of the run. Uh, so we saw we spent a good amount of time in the uh, nursery uh, collector. This is generation zero. Uh, we'll go into what this means in just a bit. But here uh, we have elapsed times, not worry about that. We have these pause numbers here. That's interesting. So we have one second maximum pause. Now, what could that mean? Well, that kind of pause implies that, you know, something stopped for a while, doesn't it? So that's not a good sign. What if that program, you know, during that second long pause was, it could have been rendering your cat video, right? You dropped, like, you know, literally tens of frames at that point, or drawing your text editor's UI. Anybody who uses Emacs probably has, uh, you know, been frustrated by the, you know, some, some gradual hangs uh, as you're loading larger files. This is a frustrating experience. Or what if it's in the critical path of your di distributed application, right? Now you have, uh, in such a case, you know, you have many components communicating over a network. They're all uh, trying to collectively guarantee some overall response time. And now all of a sudden, one of those components freezes for a second. You know, this is not good. Uh, if it's driving your car, controlling your, you know, they're all, so you can imagine the sorts of implications that such a long pause might have. So. This is why we need, uh, so, so the question really is, why is this, right? What, what can we do about this? You know, we, clearly this is not a good situation, and many other languages manage to do better. So why is GHC, and we're not alone in this, but you know, well, let's try to understand why GHC in particular uh, has this sort of long pause behavior. So to understand this, let's have a look at GHC's current garbage collector. And so, uh, GHC currently ships with a generational, two-space moving, stop the world garbage collector in sort of the default minimal configuration. You can, uh, it's actually quite flexible implementation, so you can do quite a bit with it, uh, configure it in various ways, uh, more generations, etc. But you know, in, in this case, 
the real operative bit here is the stop the world. And the stop the world bit means that the program has to be stopped for the entirety of the duration of the collection. So why is that? Well, that has to be a, a fair amount to do with this next point up here, two space moving. So what does it mean, a moving collector? Well, let's, let's look at that for a bit. So a moving garbage collection uh, roughly works as follows. So we have some set of roots. These are the, the set of values that we know are alive. These are the ones, you know, the stable pointers that you've created, stable names, the values that your thread, uh, threads are actively looking at. Um, so you, you have your threads of execution. Uh, and to collect, we're going to stop them, uh, collect the values that they are currently holding on to. This is the root set here. And they, then there's some set of closures that is reachable. It, can we, I don't know, it, can any people see this? It's a little bright up here, isn't it? Maybe we should turn off the front light if that's possible. Um, <coughs> so we have a set of heap closures. Here, these are these boxes. Heap closures, uh, you know, so here we have an application of this first function. Uh, of course, we all know the, the first function takes an argument that is a tuple. And so the first function holds a pointer to B, the closure B, which is this tuple. And the tuple has two fields, of course. You know, when we have like a just and there's sort of a loop here. So, you know, we know that heaps uh, in Haskell can, of course, you can tie knots, so you end up with loops. So <coughs> we have this situation, we have this heap. And so in order to collect it, what are we going to do? Well, you'll recall that on the from the previous slide, GHC is a two-space moving collector. So what we're going to do is we're going to create another region of memory. We're going to call the area which we are currently using as our heap. We're going to call that from space. We're going to create another region, which we're going to call to space. And what we're going to do is we're going to simply gradually, in incrementally move every value that we know to be live, that's reachable from the root set, from from space into to space. So how is that going to look? So we start by looking at, you know, we take one of the roots. Here's, uh, we're we chose A. We only have one root in this Im uh, illustration, but in general there maybe will be many more. So we're going to take A and we're going to evacuate it. So in order to evacuate a closure, we're going to take and we're going to copy it from from space into to space. And we just copied it verbatim, right? You'll note that the pointer here, its, it's argument, is still right, the uh, argument living in from space. So we're then going to overwrite A in from space with what's called a forwarding pointer. This is a, a pointer that's going to tell us where we moved A to in two space. So we're going to need that in a little bit. And we're going to add a prime is a copy of A that we just created to a data structure which we're going to call the scavenging work list. And so we're going to continue after we've evacuated all of our roots by starting to pull elements off of this work list and we're going to scavenge them. What does this mean? Well, it means we're going to look at each of the pointers in, this in the closure, the, the heap object that we are scavenging, and we are going to simply evacuate each of them. So here we We'll look at B and we'll evacuate it. That is, of course, we copy it, we add it to the work list, and we replace B with a forwarding pointer. So this makes sense so far. Are we, uh, are everybody's on the same page, great. Okay, so, <coughs> and lastly, after we've evacuated B, we're going to update A to point to B, right? So now we no longer, we've gotten rid of one reference that was previously pointing into from space. And we're gonna continue, so we're gonna out scavenge Take an element from the scavenging work list, B in this case. We're going to evacuate all of its uh, references. So C, there's D, we're going to scavenge C, and of course, when we scavenge, go to scavenge C, previously, C pointed to B in from space. B, of course, is replaced with a forwarding pointer. So when we go to scavenge this reference here, back to B, we're going to see, oh, well, we already evacuated it. And we know that, of course, because of the presence of the forwarding pointer. So we know we can simply replace the pointer in C prime with the pointer to B, with the pointer to B prime. So, and at this point, uh, we can scavenge D. that has no pointers. Uh, in this case, it's in, this is a boxed integer, uh, in case you, uh, this is new. So, right, in the end, 
we have we end up with a heap in all of our objects that we know to be live, so that is not E, which was not reachable from our root set. All of the objects we know to be live end up in two space, and so consequently, we can simply throw away from space, and we're done. So this is how uh, a moving garbage collector works. Uh, so this is a great algorithm for many reasons. Uh, so we have uh, a really efficient allocation. Uh, we can use what's known as a bump pointer allocator, which is very cheap, has very little state, uh, has gr pretty good locality. Uh, it actually sort of has the effect of repacking the, the program, your program's objects at runtime to sort of reflect their topology, which is very helpful uh, for runtime performance on modern CPUs. Uh, it's relatively easy to implement, can parallelize it easily, and quite important for Haskell, the cost of collection is only linear in the amount of live data, not the amount of garbage that you generate. And so for a language like Haskell, where you generate a lot of garbage, a lot of intermediate values, and not many of them tend to live, this is actually quite helpful in uh, maintaining good garbage collector performance. Of course, we're talking about incremental or, or uh, a, a, a new garbage collector, so there must be a problem with this. There, there must be some caveat here, and indeed there is. So in the case of moving collection, it is very difficult to get incremental collection. That is, to be able to pause a collection halfway through. So even collecting a fraction of the heap requires that we have to search the entire heap for references to the objects that we moved. Right? Of course, we need to, to scavenge objects. So let's see what happens. Um, so let, let's see why this is. So uh, in general, um, right. There are two ways we can uh, lower, uh, lower collection latency. Sorry? Of course. Uh, the entire, that entire time, yes. Uh, oh, oh, okay. So the question was, um, yeah, where was the pause in that previous here? And that pa the pause, indeed, it was from the beginning of that whole five minute ordeal. So we paused here collected the root set, pushed them all to the scavenging work list, and then ev each and every one of these steps occurred during the stop the world pause. So we had to touch every live object and move it uh, during our pause. Uh, and now after we've, uh, after we've finished, we can of course allow mutators to continue, but not until, and we'll see why uh, that is in just a moment. That's correct, yes. Yeah. So the effect here is that the pause time ends up being proportional to the amount of that live data um, that you have. So if you have a very large heap, of course, you, you know, that essentially means your pause times are unbounded. Um, and that, that is problematic for a variety of reasons. So, <coughs> so to see, so right, to lower that pause time, there are two ways we could do this, of course. So we could either allow, uh, so sort of strive for incremental collection, that is we can allow the collection, uh, allow ourselves to suspend collection at any time during the course of the garbage collection, or we can allow collection to proceed while the mutator runs. So we could have two guys, you know, the mutator's running, this is the, the mutator here is the program, um, this is uh, what the garbage collect memory management people call the, the program that the garbage collector is cleaning up after, and then uh, as the program itself runs, so does the garbage collector, and that we can somehow guarantee that they don't interfere with one another. So in this talk, we're largely going to be considering the latter here, concurrent collection. Uh, in general, if you do incremental, you have to solve most of the problems that you need to solve to do concurrent, and, and generally concurrent gives you a little bit more bang. So let's see, though, <coughs> for a moment, how, what happens if we try to just incrementalize the moving collector that we saw previously. So. We start with the same, uh, very similar sort of heap that we had previously. Um, so the object here, this is a stack. This is the uh, set of, this is a value that sort of captures the state of a thread. And that will become, uh, w w so we, this is going to be values that, uh, values that are reachable from the stack are values that the thread will try, that a thread may try to access. So we'll see why this is important in just a moment. Uh, so we, again, uh, start by evacuating, evacuating the roots. Uh, so we will start, evacuate A, move it. We will then evacuate B. And now imagine that we say, OK, well, we've done enough collection for now. Let's stop. Let's, let's just allow the threads to run for a little bit. Right, so now we're going to allow 
the thread associated with this stack to resume evaluation. But oh no, this isn't good. So this stack has a reference to B. So B, as you might recall, was previously, it was a tuple. But now, it's, a f it's been replaced with a forwarding pointer. So if you try to interpret this as a, as a tuple, you, know, you get a segfault. That, that's a, uh, in effect, this is, uh, you know, the stack, uh, the mutator is going to be looking for a much different sort of object than it will be find there, and, and consequently, uh, this is unsafe. Right, so we, we just doing the naive thing of just stopping at some point in uh, the, our moving collection, this isn't going to work. So how can we make uh, moving collection safe? Well, there are a few options. So uh, one approach would be to have the mutator check every time it looks at a pointer whether or not that pointer has been, re that object has been re replaced with a read barrier. Uh, I'm sorry, with a forwarding pointer. This is called a read barrier. Uh, so, but of course, this is, this can be rather costly, right? You, every time you look at a pointer, which happens quite frequently, you need to have some sort of condition checking whether the object has been evacuated or not. So, so maybe this will be too costly, but it actually turns out that there are a few tricks uh, that you can do to make this a bit cheaper. So this paper, uh, published um, by uh, Cheadle Field, uh, Simon and Simon, around 2000, uh, is one such trick. And here they actually use a property of GHC's evaluation model, that is that values or ob ob heap objects all have code associated with them. So e before we ever look at a value in the Haskell heap, we will enter its, uh, so enter or jump to the code associated with it. So this allows us to very cheaply, you know, the, the fact that we can essentially evaluate our arbitrary code before looking at a heap object, allow it gives us the ability to uh, ensure that uh, we it gi sort of gives us a cheap way to check for forwarding pointers. However, so this I mean, so that, that's uh, that paper uh, worked reasonably well. It, it never was merged to GHC, but in the meantime, <coughs> around 2007, this paper was published and merged to GHC. This is actually a very important optimization, faster, and it was described in this paper, uh, pointer tagging is uh, what we call the optimization. And this is where we're going to take, so essentially the Simons and, uh, you know, it's generally known that GHC uh, code did very poorly as far as branch prediction is concerned. You know, this is very important as far as microarchitectural performance is concerned on modern machines. Uh, and that the reason for that is we did lots of indirect jumps. You know, every, as I said previously, every time we would need to look at a Haskell object, we would first jump to its entry, entry code or the, the code associated with that object. And that is, uh, so essentially we would jump to an arbitrary pointer and the CPU would have no idea uh, in general where, uh, that means the CPU would be unable to predict where that jump would end up because it would have to first read the pointer to the code that the associated with the object and then jump to the value of that pointer. So that's, um, that makes things uh, a fair bit less efficient than they could be. So what, the Simons, uh, what this paper proposes is to encode a little bit of information about what kind of object we have uh, a, a pointer points at in the low bits, the unused um, sort of uh, low bits of, the, of a pointer. So if you have a heap object pointer, we know the heap objects are always aligned to eight bits. So there are three bits there, uh, th I'm sorry, eight bytes. So there are three bits, uh, the low three bits of, the, of a pointer are essentially always going to be zero. So we can use those to encode a bit of inf information. And uh, we use that in particular to encode the, the constructor tag, which is often what we're going to be uh, sort of branching on. So that allows us to recover a great deal of um, both uh, cache uh, performance as well as, as runtime. Uh, generally, uh, code runs much better. We see here uh, some numbers from that paper. We see double-digit improvements in, in cache misses, and you see similar sort of improvements in runtime. So we really don't want, so, and unfortunately, the fact that we no longer, so one of the consequences of this paper is that we will no longer necessarily jump to the entry code of a closure before looking at that closure's contents. So the paper that I mentioned up top, the nonstop Haskell paper, where uh, we would incrementalize moving collection using this feature of GHC's evaluation model to implement the read barrier is no longer accessible 
without dropping this optimization, which we really don't want to do. So what other, what other things can we do? Well, <coughs> incremental moving collection can also, uh, you can imagine we might also make it safe uh, for incremental uh, collection by splitting our heap into you know, some number of chunks and just track references between chunks. So we can then evacuate one chunk at a time and we know precisely the set of pointers that we need to update um, when, we, when we do so. We know all of the inter, uh, the, the references between these chunks, uh, but of course that requires that we track the references between chunks, and this is actually, uh, this can be quite expensive. So this is an approach, but again, it, it only g allows us to reduce our pause by a factor of one on n, the number of chunks, and the more chunks we have, the more references we need to track between the chunks, and consequently the more expensive our collector is going to be. So this is also not such a great plan. So really, what it comes down to is moving collection is actually very hard to incrementalize. So how can we actually avoid this? How, how maybe the problem here is we're actually trying to maintain moving. Uh, mo moving collection has many advantages, but incremental uh, collection is not one of them. So perhaps we should just give up moving collection. Um, s and so, <coughs> and, and it really the reason for, th for this is that moving collection invalidates references that were previously valid, right? So after we collect, we, uh, and uh, after we begin collection, we end up with uh, an inconsistent heap state until we finish collection. And so we can avoid that by simply not moving objects. So <coughs> can we avoid uh, moving collection? Of course, we can just not move objects. We can keep them in one place. But you know, there were so many advantages to moving collection. Maybe can we also keep some of those somehow? And it turns out, yes, we can. So. This is uh, what we're going to call sort of a, a hybrid moving, non-moving collector. So that is, and it, it looks something like this. So we configure our mutator, that is the program that you're running, to allocate into the same nursery that we use now. So right, your, your, Haskell object, uh, your Haskell program is going to allocate into a nice, cheap, moving nursery. So as far as your program is concerned, nothing has really changed. But then for the values that live, for an extended period of time, uh, li live, for instance, for a few garbage collections, we're going to move those into a non-moving heap. So the idea is most of the garbage that your program generates is going to die relatively quickly. And so we can get all the advantages for that set of data of allocating into a, a moving nursery. But we then, for those values that do persist, get the, have the advantage of being able to uh, collect them via a non-moving heap and a non-moving collector. And this allows for much more, uh, this is much more readily uh, incrementalized or made concurrent. Um, so data begins wi by when the mutator, uh, the, the mutator allocates into a moving nursery. It then is evacuated by the moving collector into the non-moving heap, which then gets collected by a non-moving collector. Yes? Points there, right, is that the pause time of the uh, the minor collection, the collection in the nursery, is bounded because the that's nursery right. itself is bounded at like a few hundred k or something. Precisely. Right? Yes. Yes. That's a it's a very good point. So, um, you know, of course, uh, previously we said that one of the problems with the moving uh, moving collector was that we'd have unbounded pause times, but that's only because there was no bound on the size of data that would end up in the moving heap. In the moving heap. Here, however. We're saying that th we are at most going to have to collect one nursery's full of data with the moving collector. And so that pause time now has an upper bound on it. All of the, un the unbounded thing is now the non-moving heap, which we can collect concurrently. So, all right. <coughs> so uh, for the rest of the talk, I'll be describing our design for a concurrent moving, non-moving hybrid collector uh, which we've implemented in GHC. Um, so we're going to talk about a number of things. We're going to discuss first what is a uh, mark sweep collector. Uh, then we're going to uh, it's going to be a fairly brief introduction, uh, just for those who are the uninitiated. We're then going to move on to how we make that uh, how we allow concurrent uh, collection under the non-moving uh, mark and sweep um, setting. And we'll then move, uh, discuss more concretely 
uh, how can we write uh, design an allocator that will give us most of the advantages of the um, or many of the advantages of our, of our moving uh, collector. Uh, we will then talk about how to collect and then uh, say a few words about the current status of the project. So, no, uh, m mark and sweep garbage collection is the uh, collector scheme collection scheme that we're using. Uh, and so, for our mark and sweep collector, we need two pieces of state. In our heap, we need a mark flag, what we call a mark flag. It's just a, a binary flag per heap object, and our collector is going to need to maintain a mark queue, which is a list of objects that, we're, um, that we will be uh, using during collection. And there are two operations uh, that the collector implements. So there's the mark operation, which is where we're going to push an object's pointer uh, onto the mark queue and set its mark flag, indicating that it is known to be alive, it's reachable. And then there's sweep, where we're going to traverse the heap and free all objects that are on that do not uh, that have not been marked. Oh, is uh, this clear so far to everyone? We're all all right. So, <coughs> in a uh, mark and sweep collector, uh, our collection will look something like this. So again, we have a set of roots. Uh, we'll begin very similarly as we did uh, to how we collected in the moving case. We're going to push all of the roots this time to the mark queue instead of evacuate them. But uh, and when then we're going to enter our mark loop where we're going to pull an object off of the mark queue, we're going to mark it, we're going to push all of its pointers, so here we pushed reference to B to the mark queue, and then iterate. And so here we're going to mark B, mark C, uh, and mark D, and then at the end you'll note that we again had a reference back to B, so when we go to mark B again, we're going to see, oh, it's already marked, so we don't need to do anything. There's not, no need to push its pointers again. We know they're already marked. And at the end, we're going to then traverse the heap. Here we find that E does not have this star set, meaning it was not marked, and so we can simply free it. So that seems uh, quite nice. Um, there was no need to copy anything, so you're, uh, you might have slightly um, improved uh, performance, you'd think, for uh, just due to the memory bandwidth, uh, the lack of memory bandwidth requirement that the copying implies. But uh, what about concurrency? So we said previously that we also would like to be able to do uh, much of the collection concurrently as the mutator itself is running. So can we make this concurrent? Can we do this whole marking process, which is much of the work associated with the mark and sweep collector? Can we mark concurrently? Well, let's see. So here's another heap. So we have a set of roots. Again, A and B are both reachable from the root set. And so let's say, for instance, that we start marking A. But then before we have a chance to mark B, the mutator behind our back sneakily goes and flips around. These are mvars, by the way. These are you know any, any sort of mutable uh, object will do, though. And so we'll see here that the mutator went and flipped these two references. So what happens now? This is uh, so. Then let's say we continue marking. Uh, so we have this interleaving where marked A, then the mutator mutated, and then we marked B. But now B points to X, A points to Y, and we're only marking X. Well, this is probably not going to end well, will it? So we are going to mark X. We're going to mark X again. It's already been marked, so there's nothing more to do. And at the end of collection y, which we, we know the end, uh, we've finished marking because the mark queue is empty, by the way, I had not mentioned that, but uh, so when, once we hit sort of a, a fixed point when the mark queue is empty, we're going to see that y remains unmarked. And this is quite bad. We're going to free y, of course, after in when we go to sweep. And after we do so, now the mut mutator has a reference to a dead object, an object that we've already freed through a, and that, that's quite bad. This is, again, segfault city. So how do we fix this? So in order to fix this, we use a technique uh, that's commonly known as snapshot at the beginning. So this is a, uh, a very common technique for reasoning about concurrent collectors. And for w w essentially what we're going to do is we're going to capture a picture of the heap, uh, of the reachability graph, at the start of mark, at the start of our collection, which we're going to call time t naught. 
And then we're going to collect with respect to that heap of uh, reachability graph. So that is to say that all objects that are alive, that are reachable at that in that snapshot, we're going to be sure to mark. And uh, those that are not, um, we have no obligation to mark, but we may mark. And um, those that are newly allocated while we are um, while we are marking, those that uh, sort of enter the heap uh, in the course of our collection, we also uh, we also must mark. Um, so, or we at least must be sure certain not to collect because we did not guarantee that they would be marked. So the snapshot. Uh, so we're going to essentially state uh, try to maintain this property that the collector must mark all objects that are reachable at t naught. And as well, uh, I should have written here, uh, also, we must not collect objects that are were introduced into the non-moving heap since T0. So th there are a few consequences of this. So we know that all objects that were live at T0 will be retained because they will be marked. Many objects that were dead at T0 will be freed. And I say many objects because, again, we may mark more than the, strictly s the, the set of objects that were strictly alive at T0. We try not to, of course, but some cases where this is unavoidable. So it's somewhat conservative, but it's uh, all in the name of concurrency. And then uh, objects that were allocated after uh, T0 will be re retained as well. So, is so I are we clear so far? Uh, is this, does this make some amount of sense? If there are any questions, don't, you know, please. Uh, great. So how do we ac actually accomplish this? How do we actually implement? You know, so this, this gives us sort of a, a guiding light to how, how do we accomplish st safe concurrent collection, but it doesn't really tell us much about how we should actually go about implementing this. So one way is to introduce a write barrier. Previously, we saw an example of a read barrier. This is uh, some requirement placed upon the mutator to ensure that the mutator uh, and the garbage collector sort of play nicely together. Here, the, uh, in pr in and in particular, placed on the mutator when the mutator reads an, uh, a pointer or an object. Here, however, we're going to uh, place a requirement on the mutator when it writes to an object. So it will look something like this, for instance. So here we have that heap that we had previously. And what we're going to set do is uh, we have the same sort of situation. So we start by marking A, the collector marks A. Then before the mutator, uh, the collector rather, has a chance to mark B, the mutator is going to change B to point to X. And this is where things went badly last time. So this is when the right barrier is actually going to kick in. So we're going to say before we actually update the pointer in B, we're going to say that the mutator must first inform the garbage collector by adding uh, that it overwrote a reference to Y. So Y was previously reachable, but because the mutator changed the structure of the heap, it is no longer reachable. And so it's going to add it to the mark queue. And it's going to do this. Uh, you know, this is sort of the conceptual idea uh, in implementation. Um, each capability or each Haskell thread is going to have a, um, a local set of so sort of a local mark queue, which we call the update remembered set. So after we've done this, we can then, uh, again, the collection uh, collector can, will continue. Right? We have an interleaving where we, uh, the collector will then mark B and we'll mark X. And because we added Y to the mark queue, it will, of course, also be marked. And uh, consequently, we avoided the catastrophe of the first uh, example. So this is how we uh, ensure that concurrent collection is safe. But of course, there's still a lot of uh, open questions here. Like, how do we actually structure, uh, how do we devise an allocator that allows us to cheaply allocate, uh, cheaply manage memory such that we both have reasonably cheap allocation, but also avoid fragmentation. That is, if we have uh, v lots of allocations, and then we free some memory, and we allocate again, and we free. In the naive, uh, in, in many naive allocators, you end up with uh, lots of regions with really small 
regions of free space in between. And, and that means that if you need a larger region, it can be very difficult to find such a large region uh, to allocate into. So we want to be somehow avoid fragmentation. Uh, we need, of course, some support for our mark and sweep collector in our allocator heap structure. So we need some uh, efficient decoding of the mark bits, the mark flags that we discussed earlier. We must be able to construct the snapshot that we were discussing earlier, namely to be able to identify which objects were alive at the time we started collection. Uh, and of course, we want to be able to accommodate uh, concurrent mark and sweep, uh, concurrent collection and allocation, and, and, uh, and perhaps parallel collection as well. So of course, that's a lot of requirements. It's very difficult to satisfy all of these at once, or at least to discuss them all at once. So but let's first just uh, say that we want to design an allocator that can allocate a single size of object, right? So we want, we want an, uh, an allocator that, when, it, when we ask it, it'll give us like a 32-byte region. And then we, will, uh, we can easily extend this for the, the generic case of any uh, object size. But for simplicity, for the sake of uh, discussion, we'll start with the fixed case. So how might we go about designing such an allocator? Well, we might start with something like this. So here what we've done is we, we have a block of memory, and we've split it into fixed-sized, what we call blocks. These are the regions that we're going to allocate into. So these blue regions already, for instance, have been allocated. They have objects in them. And we indicate that with a mark bit, which is also sort of allocated alongside the, the blocks here. Uh, it's just a, a bitmap. And uh, let's see. In addition, to ensure that we can easily uh, find new uh, allocation areas to allocate into, uh, we keep a pointer to the first free block. So that is to say, when, when somebody asks us, for, asks us for a allocation, we're just going to look at the next free pointer, we'll hand them that block, and we'll bump it along, searching until we find the first block with an unset uh, free bit, uh, mark bit rather. This one should have been marked. I apologize for that. So, <coughs> and we're just going to uh, continue on our merry way. Eventually, it will, of course, fill the segment. It's a sort of a fixed size uh, segment, a fixed number of blocks per, per segment. And so when we fill it, we'll just accumulate it um, into a list. So uh, what we're going to say here is each Haskell capability, again, each, each operating system thread managed by the, the runtime system, has a current segment which serves its allocations. So that's uh, e each, each capability has one segment that will it's actively allocating into. Um, and al also, as a, uh, it's important to note that we did not set the mark bit during allocation. And this will actually become quite important during collection. We'll, we'll see why in a moment. So <coughs> right. So we have uh, segments can be in one of several states. So as we discussed, uh, segments can be current to a capability. This means that that capability is actively allocated into that segment. It's being used for its as its current allocation target. Uh, we, of course, know that on several allocations, we may fill a segment. So in that case, they, a segment will be in the filled state. Yes? Yeah? When you say that a capability is allocating into a segment, that's only when it's copying from its nursery into the that's right. Segment, right. So this isn't yes, the yes. So it's only it's only when all threads so all threads <coughs> are stopping to do their generation zero collection, and then they're allocating into their segment. Yeah, that's right. So um, well, that isn't strictly speaking uh, necessary. We don't really assume that uh, the the structure of the allocator rather doesn't assume this. But yes, in practice, the R design, the allocator, the non-moving allocator serves the nursery collector. Right. And maybe also large objects or... And, yeah, so that's one case where, you know, you know, like pinned objects, for instance, you might consider allocating directly into the, into the uh, non-moving heap. So, <coughs> are there any other, qu other questions? Okay. So, uh, right, we have uh, filled segments. Um, we, of course, uh, segments, a segment may contain no live objects. Uh, we call this a free segment. Uh, and after an object, after a segment has been filled, this is precisely uh, the set of, ob the of 
objects that we're going to collect. So objects that um, live in, a fil or in filled segments are those that we're going to sweep during a given major gener uh, garbage collection cycle. Um, and this is actually quite nice because this means that uh, all segments sort of have a, an owner, so to speak, which makes it very easy to reason about concurrency, s uh, safety, uh, data race freedom uh, in the case of concurrent collection. So, for instance, uh, the current segments are owned by the capability that owns them, right? That, that is allocating into them. Uh, so that capability ha can freely mutate any of the state of that, um, or most of the state of that segment, of its current segment. Filled segments are sort of owned by the garbage collector. These are this allows the garbage collector to freely change the, um, the mark bits and, and the next free pointer, etc. cetera. Uh, as well as those the in the, the two sweep set. Uh, active segments are those that contain at least one live object, and these are sort of segments that we know have some, some free space, so when a capability <coughs> fills its current segment, it can take an object, uh, take a new segment from the active set and, and then begin allocating into that, making it its current segment. Um, and so these are owned potentially by the mutators as well, and the free segments as well, those um, all owned by the, the mutator. So we can always say concretely who has the ability to freely mutate a given segment. So, we th so the allocator state sort of consists of a set of segment lists. Uh, so we have a, a set of filled segments, a set of current segments, one for each capability, and a set of active segments. Um, <coughs> And to extend this whole uh, scheme to multiple object sizes, well, this is actually relatively straightforward. So we know we can service fixed size allocation requests with this, with this allocation structure. So we just have several of these allocation structures in parallel. Uh, we have, for, uh, for instance, one that can allocate eight uh, sized eight objects, one of size 16, one of size 32. We can just choose a set of logarithmic sized uh, spaced block sizes and uh, then choose which allocator to serve as a particular request by the size of that request. Uh, so for instance, if you need 24 bytes, then you'd use the 32 wide allocator and uh, just take the first 24 bytes of the, of the resulting allocation block. And the nice thing about this uh, scheme is it's very resistant to fragmentation. So this whole uh, family of allocators trick is a well-known trick to avoid fragmentation in uh, free list allocators like this, and, and it's, it's quite effective. Um, so, <coughs> so that's sort of how we manage the free memory that we have, uh, our, our, our heap. So the question then is, how do we figure out how to collect? How do we know when to free val uh, blocks that our allocator has allocated? And for this, um, the, uh, the collector itself uh, is a mark sweep design that we borrowed from uh, an ICFP paper presented at uh, ICFP 2016 by Wayno. This is the um, author of the SML Sharp um, standard ML implementation. Uh, the allocator as well uh, owes uh, much of its uh, content to this paper as well. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, so it, it's conservative in that we are only going to reclaim values that currently reside in filled segments, and as well only those that are that are alive at the time of um, at, at t naught, the beginning of collection, uh, because it's a snapshot of the beginning collector. Um, the write barrier entries, uh, as I said, there's this write barrier that we need to uh, put in place to ensure safe concurrent collection, and these are accumulated in capability local update remembered sets. Uh, this is just a essentially capability local mark queue. And this allows uh, us to avoid contention between uh, the uh, uh, contention on the, on the global mark queue. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, data race freedom is, is achieved by way of, of ownership. It's always clear who owns a particular segment. And so the collector itself uh, proceeds in a few stages. So we first uh, have a set of threads that are running, and eventually somebody says, oh, I ran out of heap. Okay, so now we need to stop, and everybody's stopping, and we'll, we'll start a garbage collection. So that is what happens right here. And so, of course, this is a stop the world event. This is, uh, we, we do need to stop, because we're first going to begin by evacuating everything to the non-moving heap. And this is actually um, 
a, a feature of this collector that greatly simplifies it. Often uh, people try to avoid this step here and it introduces a lot of complexity because now you have to worry about not just references to objects in the structure, in the, the non-moving heap structure, but also those in the moving heap structure which lacks much of the metadata that allows us to safely concurrently collect. Um, so we evacuate, we move all live data, do a essentially a minor collection, evacuating everything living in the moving heap into our non-moving heap. And then we're going to collect our snapshot. So this is a, uh, a set of metadata that we can very easily update that allows us to reconstruct which objects were alive at the time, or not alive, but which, which objects were allocated at uh, the snapshot point, at T0, which we designate to be this point right here. So this is the point where we're going to enable the right barrier, and at this is the snapshot point. So this whole region here, from the moment we start our non-moving collection, or the moving evacuation, to the point where we finish collecting the snapshot, this is a stop the world uh, region. This is called the preparatory pause. And after we enable the right barrier, we can start concurrently marking. So this is where um, we start a new thread. Uh, we can allow the mutators to continue executing. Uh, and while they do so, our concurrent mark is going to be traversing uh, the live objects uh, that um, both those objects recorded in the root set that was collected in the preparatory phase, as well as those that were pushed to the update remembered set due to, to mu uh, mutation. Uh, and it will mark until we reach, uh, un until it reaches a fixed point. Now there's a few events here though that we that deserve a bit of uh, discussion. So stacks in particular are very tricky. Uh, you really do not want to have a write barrier on a stack, and that's because stacks are constantly mutated. And of course a write barrier requires that you uh, do something, in this case it's add an entry to this update remembered set, every time you mutate, mutate. And this becomes extremely expensive. So it's actually quite important uh, that we avoid imposing a write barrier on stack mutation. And so consequently what we do is before a thread has a chance to begin running, it will first mark its entire, st well, its stack. Uh, and, and GHC has a chunked stack representation, which makes this uh, actually quite, um, quite easy to do in an incremental manner. So again, we, we bound the, the pause time by way of the stack chunk size. And this just involves pushing all of the pointers reachable by the, uh, from the stack to the update remembered set. And after uh, it has marked its stack, it will, uh, the mutator can run. After the concurrent mark phase is uh, reaches fixed point, it will request a, a synchronization. And this is called the pre-sweep pause. So this is where we will stop the world yet again. And we will ask all capabilities to flush their local update remembered sets. And we will uh, go ahead and aggressively mark them until again we reach a fixed point. And, and the, the thought here is that most of the work of marking has already been done at this point, and as threads fill their local update remembered sets, they will already be flushing them uh, during the course of the concurrent mark phase in here. So there's going to be a, a few stragglers, of course, so you know they will get flushed in this pre-sweep pause and ultimately marked during the pause. And after we finish this last bit of stop the world marking, we will have successfully updated the entire heap to reflect the liveness um, of uh, the liveness of all objects. And so at this point we can allow the mutator to continue and uh, then proceed in sweeping the heap. So that is just that and that can proceed concurrently with mutation as well. Um, it's actually, now that I look at it, inac inaccuracy here. So here we said that before mutation can proceed we need to mark the stack. Um, this is, of course, the right barrier that I referred to above. But um, this is actually not necessary. This is only necessary when we're actually marking. So uh, when we're in the concurrent mark phase, we enable the right barrier. And after we finish, uh, after we enter the pre-sweep pause, we actually disable the right barrier. So these blocks here, this uh, pre, um, the stack marking is actually not necessary. Should have seen that. So the, the the point there is that the right barrier actually only affects uh, mutator performance when 
we're actually actively marking, which is quite nice. So, right. Uh, so the, of course, there's the question of uh, you, you'll recall the snapshot invariant that we just defined above only requires that we mark objects which were allocated at t naught. The question is then, how do we know whether an object was allocated at t naught? Well, we do that by augmenting our allocator data structure. So we have, of course, this was the, the data structure that we had previously. Uh, we, this, of course, is the next free uh, pointer. This uh, points to the first unallocated block. That probably should not be blue. And uh, what we're going to do is simply take a snapshot of this when we begin in, in the preparation phase that we mentioned earlier. So when we begin marking, we're going to record a snapshot of the next free pointer, uh, record its value in the, the segment state. And that is to say, that uh, allows us to conclude that all objects above the snapshot pointer must have been allocated since we started marking, and all of those below were allocated prior to the beginning of marking. So, uh, let's see here. Um, this is sort of a brief outline of, of roughly what happens. It's uh, sort of rehashing what happened above. So, preparation, we're going to stop the world, evacuate all data, collect snapshot, collect a root set, and then start a concurrent mark. Marking just goes until the mark queue is empty, at which point we stop the world, request uh, the, a flush of the update remembered sets from the mutators, mark those objects that are new newly reachable due to those update remembered sets, and then we can resume the mutators and sweep, and we're done collecting. So that is our <coughs> the overall uh, the picture. Uh, the uh, mark marking, of course, um, this is the one bit of code that I will be showing, and that's because I think that this is kind of pseudo code, and it, it nicely um, illustrates the relative simplicity of the mark um, procedure here. So to mark the given closure, P, we're just going to find its segment. We can do this just with bitwise operations because of the structure of our heap, uh, and as well extracting its uh, block index, the which block. Um, the object lives in is, is again, bitwise operations. We check whether the mark heap flag is already set. If it is, well, then we needn't do anything. If it's above the next free snapshot of, that of its segment, well, then it was allocated since we began marking. So again, we don't need to do anything. And otherwise, we're just going to take e each of the closures, push, it to, uh, push each of them to the mark queue, set the mark flag, and we're done. So there's a lot of details here. This is a very high-level view of the um, collector. So there's, uh, again, the concurrent incremental marking of stacks is actually uh, quite a bit trickier than I, uh, than I made, made it seem uh, above. So um, there are a variety of Haskell-specific features, like weak pointers or um, uh, constant duplicative for uh, forms. Um, that are uh, require special treatment, large objects as well. Uh, we didn't touch on a uh, handling of cycles, which actually requires that we change the collector ever so slightly. Uh, GHC actually does some amount of evaluation during collection, so uh, the selector optimization is one such uh, case where we, which is very important for avoiding some classes of space leaks. So we have to do this uh, as well. Um, and then we have a variety of tricks to help mark efficiency, overcoming the typical um, penalty that you pay in locality due to an unmoving heap. So all of this is beyond the scope of this talk, but I'm happy to discuss it uh, later or during the questions. So, what so that we have this collector. Um, this has been implemented, uh, but before we actually talk about um, the, the state, I'd like to say, you know, set some expectations here. So what won't it do? So a concurrent collection, a collector is not a silver bullet by any means. Uh, garbage collection is full of compromises. Um, there is no such thing as the ideal garbage collector. So it won't make your program run faster, almost certainly. Uh, the current throughput-oriented collector uh, is going to be very hard to beat, if for no other reason than the locality that it provides. Uh, it will not make your program scale more effectively across cores. And this is something that people often complain about. You know, when you have a very large machine, you have 30 cores, and you want to keep your, uh, have your program run on all 30 of them in a single process, this is quite difficult because of the stop the world um, or the, 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 sort of the, the synchronization that garbage collection requires. Um, we do have some ideas on how to potentially uh, use the collector that we presented here uh, to fix this. It's something that uh, we currently don't make any attempt to do. Uh, 
It may reduce your program's memory footprint. So the moving collector, of course, you'll recall that we needed to allocate essentially twice the memory, uh, the overall residency of your program uh, when we began collection, because we need to move all of your data from, from space into two space in the case of the moving collector. Of course, here we don't need to do that. Uh, so that, you, you might think that you might get a factor of two improvement in uh, reduction in your memory footprint, but that's not quite true because of fragmentation. We still have some amount of fragmentation, so. Uh, it, it's certainly not going to provide uh, hard real-time latency guarantees. We're really targeting more the, the millisecond, uh, you know, sub-10 millisecond uh, regime as far as pause times. Uh, and it doesn't, uh, you know, it, it do your dishes or anything like this. So we have ultimately... Um, some measurements that uh, you know are quite preliminary. Uh, we really just got this working in the last few weeks. Um, so, but we can say that uh, you know GC pause times in a variety of um, sort of real-world applications uh, reduce generally between a factor of five and fifty. It's an asymptotic difference. So you know it really depends upon the the size of the heap that you're collecting. Um, but in general, more importantly, major pauses are. Uh, pretty comparable to the minor collection uh, pause time. And that's what you would expect, right? Because in order to begin a major collection in the stop the world region of the, the preparatory phase, we first do a minor collection. And the cost of collecting the snapshot is pretty negligible. So, And uh, we, of course, have some reduction in uh, mutator throughput. It's uh, on the order of 10% at the moment. Uh, we believe that um, because there's a variety of features that remain unimplemented so far that will help uh, mutator performance, this number can be greatly improved, but we've yet to start on this. So what remains? Well, things mostly work currently. I was going to show you a demo. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the demo crashed, so clearly not everything works, but uh, the we have around 20 failing test, case, uh, test cases in the test suite, in GHC's test suite. Uh, out of 15,000, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, but, but, you know, that's 20 uh, rather resistant to uh, resolution, but we'll get there in the coming weeks. Uh, we will be characterizing optimiz and optimizing the collector. Uh <laughs> we'll be continuing to characterize and optimize um, in the following weeks, and then uh, hopefully be able to... Ah, oh it's okay, we're almost done. <coughs> and, and then there's a great deal of work that remains in implementing things like the cost center profiler, um, the STM implementation, which is quite tricky due to uh, the concurrency that it implies is, is not adequately, adequately tested, so that will take some work to, to prove. Um, these features are currently disabled, the selector optimization, indirection shortcutting as well, which is actually one of the things that we expect to improve mutator performance rather markedly. So these are disabled um, just to aid debugging. Uh, and RTS shutdown is terrible. Uh, it really is um, very hard to get this right. So often uh, the programs that we run will often deadlock it at, uh, at shutdown. Um, this is something that uh, we're working on fixing, but has been very difficult to get right. Uh, so in general, we hope to have all of this done by um, the merge window, before the merge window for 8.10 closes. Um, so we hope that this will be uh, usable by then. Um, so, on the whole, we've uh, implemented a non-moving collector for GHC, uh, which shows great promise in reducing pause times uh, with fairly minimal impact on runtime performance. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions, and uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> All right, I think... Thank you, Ben. Yes. Are there any more questions? I think we have one back. Oh. Hello? Oh, okay. So the last few slides have been a bit of a downer. You talked about <laughs> all those things that don't work and how it's not a silver bullet and will not solve this and that. So just to rephrase it, what did we actually gain by that? Well, I mean, so m many of these are the state, you know, the fact of the matter is uh, this only started running code a few weeks ago, really, you know, so that's uh, or running real programs uh, at scale, you know, with true concurrent collection. So once these, uh, these are all issues that are transient issues, right? They will be fixed. Um, so after they are fixed, um, 
you know, you will have the ability to run a program uh, with reasonable assurance that you're not going to uh, pause for, you know, anything more than a few, a 10 milliseconds or so. So all the remaining stop the world pauses are bounded now? They are either bounded, uh, so not quite bounded. Um, so the, the constant factor, you know, there is like an O of N, right, in the uh, pause time of uh, major collection still. Um, but the constant is very, very small. Uh, so in, a, in essence, yes. Uh, you know, we in, in particular, collecting the snapshot right here, we do actually need to walk over all of the segments in your program. But uh, you know, segments are rather large. So there are very few of them, even if you have a very large heap. Uh, so on the whole, uh, we don't expect that to be a significant, you, know, you, you really have to get into like the you know, terabytes of, of heap, I'd imagine, before you end up uh, you know, having significant cost ac according to, um, due to this. Uh, let's see, as far as the remaining uh, linear factors, um, I'm sorry? Uh, yeah, right, of course. I mean, so this is actually one of the uh, interesting points here. Um, you know, people often complain that GHC's runtime system does not deal particularly well with uh, high thread counts, and that's in large part due to the fact that nursery collections, you know, the nursery is by default sized to roughly the size of your caches, which is fairly small. So if you want to uh, run with a large thread count, you're going to naturally fill your nurseries very, very quickly. And every time you fill your nursery, you need to synch all cores need to synchronize in order to initiate a, a minor collection, and this is quite expensive. So often, a trick to avoid this is to increase the size of your nursery, you know, and make it even like tens of megabytes, you know, and there you're only you have to synchronize, you know, hundreds or of microseconds or milliseconds at a time, right? So this is actually um, a, a pretty common trick, and this uh, is actually in somewhat incompatible with the, you know, well, hmm. so the larger your nursery is, the larger this, is, this step here is going to take, the larger your evacuation is going to take. Um, so in typically, you know, you have so much memory bandwidth that I, I doubt you're going to run into, um, it doesn't make sense to size the nursery so large that you have, you know, it takes, well, I should be careful, you know. So yes, I mean there there's a trade-off there, right? If either you if you want to run on a very large thread count, then you need a uh, fairly large nursery size. But of course that takes longer in the moving collection. So you might consider, for instance, um, allocating directly into the non-moving heap, right? That would allow concurrent collection without the need for um, uh, this this preparatory evacuation. You know, you'd eliminate the moving collection entirely from, uh, from the program, and that's definitely you know this is what Go does essentially, right? They have a, a non-generational mark and sweep concurrent collector, and it's um, it performs reasonably well. Uh, in general, often you actually it's a trade-off, of course, run to throughput versus latency, but often people are very willing to make that uh, trade-off. It's much easier to buy more computers than it is to deal with unpredictable response times in many cases. So, uh, yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. There's one back here. Thank you. <coughs> so, uh, for that pre-sweep uh, pose, if I understood correctly, um, the different capabilities are going to uh <coughs> Uh, add uh, all of the uh, objects in the remember set uh, to the queue that uh, the uh, mark and sweep uh, is using, right? right. Yeah. Uh, so that was the same, uh, basically, it was displayed before in the other slides uh, as uh, the, um, uh, basically during the write barrier, uh, those objects were added directly to that queue, but actually the idea yeah. is, Okay, I was just trying to say that basically that operation was actually the same, just simplified. Yeah, that's right. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Whoops, sorry. Oh. So the, the, the question, question and then a comment. Um, question is, so with a, with a concurrent collector, you know, it, it's collecting concurrently while the mutator is mutating. What What's the mechanism that stops the, you know, if the mutator is generating garbage at a furiously high rate, uh, what's the mechanism that eventually limits the, the mutator <laughs> so that the garbage collector 
actually can collect at the yeah rate. how do you avoid runaway of, of the yeah. heap size um, yeah well th this is ultimately one of the things that um, one of the reasons why we can't say that this is a hard real-time system you know uh, one of many reasons but uh, ultimately if you do have such a high rate of garbage collect uh, garbage generation um, that the collector needs to run you know it, it you're generating faster than the garbage the collector can collect uh, then you will have to stop the mutator there is simply no way around it um, otherwise you'll run out of memory and then you know that's obviously to be avoided so uh, there is not a great th there's not a perfect solution there right we, we're just going to have to um, uh, ensure that the mark can keep up um, now this collector I didn't discuss this but the collector can actually do parallel mark um, and parallel sweep uh, so if you have enough if your mutators are generating enough garbage that one core cannot keep up, uh, then you can just keep adding cores in principle, uh, and you know you has essentially reserve as many cores to the concurrent collection as is necessary to keep up with the mutator load. Um, this is not something we've implemented, but it could be easily implemented. Uh, and then a comment. Uh, I just want to say that it. People don't necessarily realize, uh, working on these garbage collection systems, how fiendishly difficult um, <laughs> it is. I mean, Simon Marlowe spent 10 years making our current you know, awesome GT. Um, so I just want to make sure that yeah, people appreciate um, what a, actually an amazing job Ben and Omar have been doing <laughs> and how many hours they've spent with GDB tracking down seg faults. And, <laughs> uh, and I want to say you know, thank Quite you. Um, <laughs> this is awesome, awesome work. <laughs>